disclosures. Uh, I have no disclosures, uh, and I did think that we were going to be on the uh, response system, so I have a question. Let's see. So uh, this is a patient I saw a couple months ago, 40-year-old obese female with asthma who visited the ED four times in the last six months. Really hate to see her when she comes to my clinic. Last ED, vis ED visit, she basically had expiratory wheezes, a peak flow of 425 liters per minute. She was on a lab lama inhaled steroid. And my question to you is, what would you do to reduce ED visits? Basically, give her low-dose oral corticosteroids. Anybody want to do that to her? Well, that's sure a possibility. Azithromycin 500, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Well, I mean, that's something I see Dr. Maselli do every once in a while. I mean, she's obese, a PPI twice a day with H2 blockers at bedtime. Well, at the postgraduate course, they were talking about PPIs. Maybe get her a study, a sleep study, because she has OSA, and we know OSA can, can improve asthma. Or we could taper her off of every one of her medications and perform a methacholine test. Well, what is this lecture? This lecture is about methacholine and bronchoprovocation. So those test takers who were smart would have immediately gone to number E, knowing that this lady could be one of those phenotype, you know, threes, obese patients that basically may have hypersensitivity to very small changes in their airway and come into the ED with true symptoms. <laughs> I have no asthma, just so you know. But if I wanted to come to the ED and get seen, I could easily wheeze with a peak flow of 500 liters per minute, just so you know. So why is that important? And I think one of the takeaway messages is that basically there's at least three studies now. This was the Canadian study. 540 people with MD diagnosis of asthma titrated off their medication, did a methacholine, I would have thought that in obese people this would have been common, but thin people, non-obese, maybe not. But several of the studies have shown that basically a third of all people with MD diagnosis of asthma do not have asthma. The unique thing about this study from Canada is they followed them for the next year and actually showed that over an entire year, over two-thirds of them required no medication. So I think one of the things when we talk about bronchoprovocation studies is really should we consider it in patients with asthma, maybe even severe asthma. This is just basically my experience in the last couple of years. Had five patients seen to me from other pulmonologists, two with vocal cord dysfunction, now called ILO, two obese with normal functions, lung functions, deconditioned, and one patient that actually had a cylindroma. So what should we really know about bronchoprovocation? I was kind of surprised at the postgraduate course yesterday. There were people arguing about how long you should take people off of inhaled steroids or oral steroids to do a methacholine challenge. And of course, the guidelines say you shouldn't have to. And if you really understand methacholine and histamine, you would understand that's the correct answer. Because these are direct provocation tests. They bind the M3 receptor and because acetylcholine esterase doesn't break them down, they cause consistent contraction in patients, okay? So really we're not testing for asthma when we do a methacholine, we're testing for airway hyperreactivity, which is a key feature of asthma, but not unique to asthma. So when I was up at uh, McMaster's doing a statistics tour, which I failed, needless to say, but one of the things they did teach me is at least to separate out snout tests from spin tests, okay? So sensitivity, SN, rule things out, whereas specificity rules things in. So when we do a methacholine or a histamine challenge, these are negative tests. It means that it makes asthma unlikely, but as we'll see, there are many things that cause positive methacholine. In fact, in studies in the United States, when they take perfectly healthy, non-smoking patients, at least four and a half percent of U.S. volunteers have positive methacholine. If you go to Switzerland, it's 9%, which I'll show you in a minute. So again, if we're using it to diagnose asthma, that's probably incorrect. On the other hand, most of the data supports 
Uh, and this was a very nice review, the current opinion of pulmonary medicine on all kinds of bronchoprovocations, much deeper than I'm going to be able to go to into. But if you look at several of the most common, eucapnic voluntary hyperventilation, hypertonic saline, exercise, and mannitol, which I will say, going to the FDA website, it appears to me that we may get mannitol back in the United States in the next year or so. They're already at the FDA. There's already a company that's really looking at reproducing it for North America. But these particular tests change the osmolarity of the airway and the inflammatory cells, mostly basophils and eosinophils, release bronchoconstricting mediators. So it's a much more specific test, okay? So if you're looking for someone with exercise-induced bronchospasm that doesn't have classic asthma, doing a methacholine really is not an appropriate test. Really, you would want to do a, an indirect and not a direct bronchoprovocation. Again, when we don't have mannitol, Probably the most, one of the more common done, since we don't have the setup to do exercise, is a 4.5% hypertonic saline, which at least in the Australian suggestions on how to separate out asthma COPD from asthma COPD overlap, Peter Gibson actually says they think that asthmatics respond to hypertonic saline and COPDs don't. I've never been able to find that reference I'll email them this afternoon and see why they put that in the Australian guidelines. So what are the indications? Well, if you really look at it, most of the time I do a methacholine challenge. It's because somebody has a chronic cough, keeps them up at night, their spirometry is normal. I might add that in many PFT labs, if you have normal spirometry, they don't actually give bronchodilator challenge. Our lab, they do, and the studies actually show if you have the 12% response in, in 200 cc's, that actually correlates 85% of the time with the positive methacholine. So I really insist on people with chronic cough and normal spirometry that we actually give them four puffs of albuterol and try to save them the methacholine challenge just because it's timely uh, and takes up a lot of our lab technicians' times. But again, it's often used in fields of occupations. We have people who work in the lab. As you may know, any warm-blooded animal, including the little mice, the little rats that we work at at the university, are sensitizers, and people can get asthma and allergies directed to any warm-blooded animal. So sometimes in labs where they do research, they actually use bronchoprovocation tests to see if they're high risk or they become allergic to something. Others, because they're firemen and they're going to be exposed to dust and smoke, they want to know whether they're this, in this group of people with airway hyperreactivity, and I'll show you some data why that may be important. And then Sant, back in the 90s, actually looked at using it to increase the amount of inhaled steroid as long as they had response to methacholine, a very low dose, they kept going up on inhaled steroids and showed they had a better outcome at one in two years. Again, I think with pheno and with bloody eosinophils, I think that's probably not going to be done. But again, you also need to know the contraindications, and different organizations basically pick different cutoffs of where they think it's dangerous to do it. I'll point out that the reference here is the ATS-ERS combined 2018 guidelines on bronchoprovocation came out electronically in 2017 on paper 2018. And they chose FEV1s less than 60% or less than 1.5 liters if you're going to do bronchoprovocations except for exercise or uh, hyperventilation, where they said less than 75. Again, I was asked recently whether or not somebody who had an MI or a stroke in the last couple of months, could we do a methacholine? And the guidelines suggest shouldn't be done if they've had either of those in the last three months. Anybody with severe hypertension, their cutoff is 180 over 100, aortic aneurysms, or recent eye surgery. Now, they don't ever mention, if you go to the FDA and actually look at, can you do a methacholine in a woman who's in childbearing age or breastfeeding a child, they say there is no data, and their recommendation is in females that could become pregnant not to do methacholines unless it's within 10 days after the onset of menses. So for those people on the West Coast in California, 
where they worry about litigious patients, I would just suggest that uh, you might want to look at that because that is as part of their, uh, their recommendations uh, in the insert for the FDA. So again, the new guidelines actually make a switch. I, as a fellow, we always did the PC provocative, provocative concentration of methacholine that drops the FEV1 at 20%. I actually went back and looked at our lab to see what nebulizer we use for methacholine. We took the cheapest one off the mar that can be bought on the market, which gives you different amounts of exhaled medications even from within the same crate, okay? So we were really non-compliant. We had no idea how much methacholine we were actually giving at each level. And therefore, the new guidelines actually say we should look at the provocative dose that drops the FEV1 20% rather than the concentration. And the reason was it's consistent across labs and all the modern nebulizers actually tell you the output and the particle size if you read the insert. So I looked at what we were supposed to be using. We were supposed to use the English right nebulizer, or if we were going to use a dosimeter, the Davilba 646, and those are hard to get. And so again, when the methacholine challenge with the PC20 came about, we knew those nebulizers and dosimeters gave the exact amount. Now we don't. Again, the output should be at least 0.13 mLs per minute but the particle sizes have to be very small from one to 3.6 microns, okay? And so we ended up ordering the Aero Eclipse. Uh, when you actually look at it, the Aero Eclipse has these size particles, but it puts it out so quickly since it's a breath actuated, you could do an entire dose in 20 seconds. So we had to actually dilute it three to one so that you didn't give them 20 seconds, I might take one breath or I might take three breaths, depending on my breath rate. And so basically, they suggest you start at one to three micron doses, and then you can either, if the PFTs are normal or near normal, and you can double or quadruple the dose, and they recommend that you not have a breathing time of 20 seconds like we could have done, but at least one minute, so that most people take the same amount of breaths, and that 30 to 90 seconds after the dose, you go ahead and do a PFT times two, and then stop at 400 micrograms. Again, which drugs do you need to hold? Here's kind of the list for the RU Tusca protocol, UT Health Science Center. Basically, I think the takeaway message, it surprises most people that if you're on a LAMA, long-acting muscarinic, you have to be off 168 hours. That's a week. So our protocol is a LAMA off for a week, a lab, a lab, a ICS, 48 hours, short acting beta agonists the night before we tell them to stop after midnight and to not take it. Again, what are the cutoffs now if we're going to use provocative dose instead of provocative concentration? Anybody who's greater than 400 micrograms and still hasn't dropped by 20% is called negative. Basically, anybody who's 100 and below is considered positive. 100 to 400 is borderline, and less than 25, we call those very significant airway hyperreactivity. One question is, is, and we've never done this, but the guidelines suggest, and I found this article in the journal Thoracic Disease, that basically says that if they drop by 10%, you might want to go ahead and consider repeating the test, because many people actually develop a positive. And again, if we look at the positive causes, since this is only a rule out test, you can see a long list here. The last thing, and I'm actually going to skip this study, but at the bottom of it, it was a pollution study in Switzerland, and it showed if you have airway hyperreactivity, which was 9% of the Swiss population, and they followed up 10 years later, if you didn't smoke, your odds ratio of getting asthma was threefold, and if you smoked, your odds ratio of getting COPD was 4.5. And so it basically suggests that people with airway hyperreactivity are setups for asthma and COPD. And this is really the last slide. It basically just says that you might want to consider if they have 10% fall but not 20, but they complain of chest tightness, wheeze, or dyspnea, that you either follow up the study in three to six months or you do it when they get worse. I'm not going to talk about allergen provocative tests because my time is up, but I will say that 
the takeaway message is you have to make sure you have an accurate diagnosis of asthma and that if you have a patient you can't treat, it's probably worth considering tapering them off medications and trying a methacholine and seeing if they really have asthma. So thank you.